It's uh, my pleasure now to t introduce uh, the first regular talk of this conference. Um, it's going to be, pre be presented by Yi and Serge. Um, just like uh, Professor Wirt, they come from all the way across the city, from ETH Zurich. Um, and uh, they will talk on a subject that uh, bridges um, the divide between uh, specification and testing. Um. Thank you, Andres. Good morning, everybody. Sometimes you're sitting in your office. You think you're working, but you're not. The same thing also happens in your automated unit testing tool. You think it is testing your software, but it is not. It may get stuck in the face of generating valid test cases. This talk will address the, prob address the issue of valid test cases. To be fully automated, a unit testing tool must be, first of all, can, must be able to automate it, execute test cases, but it also must be able to automate, automatically generating valid test cases first and verify the results at the end. As Nicholas already said, assertions can help to increase the quality of the, of the software. And then, at the same time, it can be helpful to automate the testing because normally a routine doesn't work with arbitrary input data and it is not supposed to generate arbitrary outputs. It needs preconditions to specify the, the properties to specify the properties over the inputs in order to make the function call, to make the routine function properly. And it needs post conditions to specify the constraints over the generated results. As I said before, as I said before, with preconditions, it may cause a problem for the automated testing tool because you're in a case that not arbitrary data is okay. The tool have to come up with valid inputs. In general, pre and post conditions are called contracts. Let's first have a look at a specific example of contracts. Here is a put routine from an array list. It puts an element into the specified location of the list. Precondition specified here says that the list must have at least one space slot, one empty slot for the element, and the specified location should be within the length of the array. And the post condition listed here says after the insertion of the item, first of all, first of all, the length of the list is increased by one. And then the inserted item should be available from the specified position. In automated unit testing, preconditions can be used as input filter because it tells you which input data are valid. And post conditions can be used as oracle to verify if the result is correct. Although Knowing the precondition doesn't help us to come up with a valid input data that's satisfying those preconditions. It enables a very easy implementation of a unit testing tool, random based testing. We don't know how to generate valid, test case, valid inputs, but we generate arbitrary data and then use a very cheap way to validate if this input it's okay for the routine on a test. So the general architecture of a random based testing tool will be first select the output, select the routine on a test, and then randomly select some data, use the precondition to verify if these are input uh, valid data 
and then evolve the routine. As an example, we can continually generate data and then generate test cases. As the test going on, more and more data are generated, more and more routines are tested, and the two should also create an object pool collecting all the objects that are encountered during the testing process so far, so it can be reused again. But, sorry. Although this strategy seems very naive, but it has been applied to find thousands of faults in production software. As said before, the precondition can cause some problems in generating valid test cases because the two may stuck in generating, stuck in picking out the correct input values. So there are two consequences here. One, some routines or some part of the program is never tested. Two, even though part of the program is tested, most of the test cases generated are invalid in the sense that the test case valid, and the test case falsifies the preconditions of the routine on the test, which means a lot of time are wasted in those um, invalid test cases. Let me show you the problem I, I mentioned before. What I have here is IPO Studio. It is an IDE for the IPO language. There is a tool called AutoTest, which, which implements the contract-based random testing strategy or the OR strategy we mentioned, um, we're talking about later. It is developed in the Chair of Software Engineering in ETH Zurich. I'll show you the two. In here, I specify the class to test. It's the link list that you've seen before. And I put link list cursor to be tested together with it. The cursor in the link list encapsulates the idea of a location. And this cursor is used as a um, iterator for the list. These two classes are strongly connected. Experience show that when strongly connected classes are tested together, the chance of finding more faults are higher. So we put it together. I specify the testing to be one minute. And now I start testing. You can see from here is the testing output. Every line represents a test case. There are three possible outcomes from four test cases: passed, failed, and invalid. Test cases ends with ends normally, which we're not very happy about, because the single role of testing is to make the software fail. And a fail a failed test case ends with an exception indicating a fault in the software. The, the third state is the invalid test cases you see here, and they're quite common. They represent test cases that does not, that do not satisfy the precondition of the routine on the test. They're fairly common, and for some routines, all the generated test cases are invalid. Hence, we have the problem before. The testing tool may continuously try but fail in generating even a single valid test case. Okay, let's have a look at what are 
those preconditions which are very, very difficult to satisfy by the testing tool. Here is one. It's a remove bright cursor from a red list. It takes a cursor and removes the item to right of the cursor location. It has five precondition predicates. Some trivial ones stating this list should not be empty, the cursor is, um, is not void, and there are some non-trivial ones specifying the cursor must be in such a position where the item to write of it exists. In fact, the testing tool in fact, the testing tool failed to generate even a single test cases in a test about 30, run, 30 hours. It's a very long. But when we actually look at the testing process, we found that actually in the object pool where we've seen before, which collects all the objects that are encountered in the testing process so far, there are actually a few object combinations or a few list cursor combinations that does, that do satisfy this precondition. For example, in a randomly chosen test run, at the beginning of the 50th minute, there are five out of almost 70,000 combinations that satisfy this particular, particular precondition. But since the probability of choosing the right one is very low, the testing tool failed in doing so. Another common pattern is preconditions containing linear, linear constraints. This is the case. Well, it will prune n elements at and after a specified location. So the location must be within a certain range. And this kind of linear constraints happens quite often, especially in data structure or, or container classes. But the testing tool or the OR strategy has great difficulty in generating valid test cases for those preconditions. The general observation is that during purely random testing, actually some objects that satisfy certain preconditions exist, but it is not selected effectively. As a solution, we implement a pre-guided object selection strategy for preconditions satisfaction. We'll use PS strategy later to keep track of those precondition satisfying objects as the testing go, it goes on. And when objects are needed in when objects are needed to generate test cases, those precondition satisfying objects are selected in a higher probability. For linearly constrained preconditions, we we'll use a linear constraint solver. As a comparison, the workflow of the PS strategy or the new strategy is displayed on the right. The different steps are highlighted in red boxes. The first difference is that in object selection, instead of random selection, we will select objects that we already know precondition pre satisfying. So the probability of generating a valid test case is higher than before. Of course, in order to keep track of this information, we need a data structure. We call it predicate evaluation pool. After every test case execution, we need to do something to populate the pool. That's the, that is the second difference. The third difference is that it's for optimization sake. In order to make the tool effective, we we'll introduce some heuristics to 
only turn the precondition satisfaction on from time to time, not always. I'll explain this later. Let's first have a look at the object, the predicate evaluation pool, and how to select or generate, generate valid test cases from it. The object evaluation pool is structured in a table style. All the preconditions in the test, in the classes on the test, as an entry in this table. And some of the, some of the objects that satisfy this particular predicate is associated with this, is associated with the predicate in the pool. In the bottom is part of the object pool we see there are some lists, some cursors, C1, C2, C3, and some other random objects. And in the, cen in the center of the screen, the five precondition predicates of the remove right cursor routine are listed. And some objects that's in the pool, in the object pool, that satisfy those predicates are attached to this, to these predicates. To se in order to select valid inputs, the PS strategy will go, o go through the predicates, the desired predicates in the pool, and try to construct a combination that satisfies all the required precondition predicates. For example, the two may first consider combination L1 and C1, but unfortunately, it is not a valid input for remove right cursor because it only satisfies four out of five of the required precondition. Another alternative is the combination L2 and C2. They together satisfy all the preconditions, thus they are, they are they can be used to generate a valid test case for remove right cursor. Just like the OR strategy needs to build to build up the object pool by collecting all the objects that are encountered so far, the PS strategy needs to populate the predicate evaluation pool as the test goes on. There are, two kinds of the, there are two kinds of updates. One, up to every passing test case, because the test case is passing, we know that the system is all right. We evaluate part of the predicates as long as the signature of the predicates fits the objects that are used in the last <coughs> passing test cases. So this way, we try to grow predicate evaluation pool as much as possible. We, so we can have more choices during the guided object selection phase. Of course, beca because the objects are reused to generate new test cases as test goes on, the states of the objects may change. As a result, there may be inconsistency in the predicate evaluation pool. To totally remove this problem, we're required to re-evaluate the whole pool after every test case execution. This is very expensive. So we do it in a lazy case, in a lazy fashion. Only when we see some objects violate the particular predicate, we go to the um, particular position in the pool and remove this pre precondition violating um, object combination. For example, here is another routine, replace at cursor. It will replace a value at a, at a cursor location and it has three um, precondition assertions. Here is part of the predicate evaluation pool and as test goes, goes on, more and more um, preconditions satisfying 
objects are added into the V pool. For example, after a test case new cursor, a cursor is created right for the list. So valid cursor evaluates to true on this object combination. Mm -hmm. Of course, because this cursor is um, because a cursor is returned, it is not void, which means cursor not, the predicate cursor not void it evaluates to true on the return cursor. As it goes on, the object C satisfies the precon satisfies the predicate not all. At this end, LC as the object combination actually can be used as invalid test inputs for replace a cursor because they together satisfy all the preconditions, all the preconditions of the routine. But unfortunately, the testing strategy decided to call wipeout. Wipeout does two things. One, remove all the elements from the list. Two, move all the cursors attached to the list off the list which means this C does not satisfy not all anymore. But because L is the only object that um, used in the last test case, only predicates associated with L get evaluated, which means after this step, C is predicated predi predicate not of is not evaluated on C, leaving some inconsistency in the predicate pool. Of course, if the next, next um, test case is for replace a cursor, it will fail because LC as a combination doesn't satisfy all three predicates anymore. In this case, we observed well, that LC is precondition violating for this particular predicate. The reason that this happens is that the V pool only contains snapshots of the properties that holding in a certain time at a certain time point in the object pool. It doesn't say anything after that. To correct this problem lazily, we only do something after there is a precondition violation indicating an invalid test case. In this case, we know that L and C are not satisfying this particular predicate in the pool. So we go to the V pool and remove it prevent it from being selected wrongly again in future test cases. A question will be, if even the PS strategy can generate invalid test cases, what's the success rate of it? According to our experiment, this, the overall success rate is above 60% compared with the old strategy, which is below 10%. So it's a great improve, improvement. Okay. For linear constraint solving, we use the LP solver, which is a widely used linear programming solver. For particular constraint, it can give a minimum and a maximum solution. The PS strategy used this solution to define the possible solution space and one particular integer from this from this range is selected for uh, as a input candidate of course by only knowing two extreme values doesn't mean that every value in between are valid the peer strategy well actually we decided to assume so and according to our experiment almost all the cases it is it is, this, the assumption is correct. And we give slightly higher probability to extreme values. 
the border values because um, studies in boundary testing showed that border values has higher probability of revealing faults because the well, because the linear solving is slow compared with um, searching in a predicate evaluation pool, we cache every result. So the next time when a similar problem comes up, we consult cache mode. Optimization. Even though searching in the V pool is much, much faster than searching in the optic pool because the V pool only containing precondition satisfying objects, it still involves a lot of overhead. If we enable the precondition satisfying search every time, the overhead will be 50 to 70 percent and mostly due to linear solving. This, in this way, in this way, although we can generate more valid test cases, but the over the overall effectiveness of the testing process goes down. One, no more routines are tested. Two, we found much less faults because the number of faults are the number one criterion for us. We can say no, no, no for this one. That's why we need to have this optimization. We use some heuristics to only turn on precondition satisfaction search from time to time. Basically, the heuristic says if this routine has already is tested quite recently, we don't turn it on. We don't turn the precondition satisfaction on now. If this routine has not been tested for a long time, we turn it on. We this heuristics keeps a good balance of generating enough many test cases while preserving the original speed of traditional random testing. Okay, now I have explained the um, algorithm of the guided object selection strategy. I'll hand it over to Selch, who will present the result in the evaluation. <coughs> Thank you, Jason. So, uh, the theory might, the strategy might look good in theory and on paper, but to really know if it is better, we had to run a uh, large-scale evaluation. So we will be comparing the new strategy, the PS strategy, uh, to the old one, the original one, the ORS. So basically, uh, we wanted to concentrate the evaluation on four big questions. Uh, the primary one being, how many more routines can we actually test? So Jason said the OR strategy misses quite a few routines because of unsatisfied preconditions. We wanted to know how many more routines can we test. Second is uh, how often can we generate valid test cases? How often can we test these routines? Third one being uh, how many more faults can we find? In the end, this is what's interesting, right, about a, a testing strategy. We want to find faults. And the last point is how fast is the strategy? We don't want it to be uh, to be a lot f a lot slower than the original. Okay, the uh, experiment was set up in the following way: we had 92 classes from uh, two libraries, the IFABase and Gobo. These are two widespread uh, libraries. They are used in production software, so the faults found are really production uh, are really faults found in production uh, production software. And it covers a wide variety of data structures, so arrays, lists, trees, stacks, and there's, yeah, there's even a lexer based on regular expressions. We arranged these 92 classes into 57 groups based on, um, on how closely related they are. So some classes have to be tested together. It makes much more sense to test them together. For example, there's dependency between the classes. And um, this results in a higher diversity in the object pool, thereby hoping to find more faults. Uh, we run these uh, on 30 test runs of one hour each, and for both strategies, so the old one and the new strategy. 
and this results in uh, nearly three and a half thousand hours worth. So back to the first question, the primary goal. How many more routines can we test with the PS strategy compared to the OR strategy? Um, for this, let me first introduce a, uh, a concept, because we did not uh, evaluate this on all the routines, but only on the so-called hard routines. Hard routines are routines for which the original strategy failed to generate a test case in 90% of the cases. The other, the other routines, the easier ones, are not interesting because they're already covered by OR. So we're going to concentrate on these hard routines. This is the coverage graph between the two strategies. On the left is the OR strategy, the original one. On the right is the PS strategy. Uh, we see that OR covers roughly 60% of the hard routines. And the PS strategy, a bit more than 80%. And what's interesting is that the PS strategy manages to cover 56% of those which were missed by the OR strategy. So it does test more, more routines, but it also failed to test 1% of the routines which could be tested before. So in general, it's a, it's a good improvement, but we did not find. We could not test all the routines tested. Um, to the second question, how often can we test these routines? Well, this is a graph we generated. On the x-axis, we have the, uh, the hard routines. So it's about 1,000 hard routines in total in these. 92 classes. On the y-axis, we have the number of valid test cases, the number of generated valid test cases. The blue area is the OR strategy, and the red area is the PS strategy. And now what might be a little bit uh, difficult to, to see is that each line is actually one feature. Uh, sorry, one, one hard routine. So it looks like an area, but actually it's made off of single lines. So for each routine, we can see how many test cases were, were generated by OR and how many were generated by PS. What's interesting in this graph is that for some of the routines, we can generate a lot more test cases. So with the new strategy, some routines become a lot, lot, lot more easier to test. But for some of them, um, we cannot succeed in, in uh, testing more. In, in generating more valid test cases. So we actually on a par with the OR strategy. But overall, we managed to, uh, to generate over three and a half times as many test cases as the OR strategy. So uh, the primary or the, the most important things about, about testing, how many faults did we manage to find? Um, this is a graph showing on the x-axis the different class groups. As I said, there's 57 class groups. And on the y-axis, the percentual increase or decrease in the number of found faults. Uh, what we're targeting for is, of course, the positive increase, which is shown on the left. This is really what uh, we would like all the test classes to be in, in there. But unfortunately, it's not the case. So this is when the peer strategy finds more faults. This is when it finds equally as many faults. And this is when it finds less faults. Um, there's 28 groups out of the 57 where we'll find more faults. There's uh, 19 where it's uh, equally many faults. And there's 10 where we find less faults. But what's surprising is that in three class groups, we find over 30% more faults, which is quite, quite a lot. Um, now, the faults might be discovered by different strategies. Not, like I said before, the PS strategy does not manage to find all the faults. So this, uh, this pie chart shows the totality of the faults um, separated in, into which strategy found the faults. So the blue area means that uh, it was found by both the strategies, nearly 80%. Uh, what's, uh, what's nice is uh, the 15% found by the PS strategy. What's not so nice is the 6% found only by the OR strategy. So this shows that even though the PS strategy is better in many areas, it does not find all the faults that the old strategies find. Uh, in total, there's a 10% increase in the number of faults. So overall, uh, 
strategy performs better. This is the same data, but uh, divided into class groups. So um, each bar represents one class group, and on the y-axis, we have uh, the number of, of found faults, of distant faults. What's interesting in this graph is to see that it does not perform equally well across all the class groups. So some class groups perform extremely well. The ones on the left uh, sh clearly show that where there are already a lot of faults found by OR. The PS manages to find even more, uh, a lot more. Um, then some are very nice when there's no green at all, but a new, uh, a lot of, of, of red in the bar, which means the PS found a lot of new faults. And then there are some which are not so nice where there's no green. Um, yes. Now onto the detection probability. The detection probability is uh, how probable is it for Yes, yeah, what is the probability uh, of a strategy to detect a given fault in one single run? Because the motivation is the higher the probability, the less fault, the less runs you're going to need to find this fault. So we want the probability to be, uh, to be close to one, to be, to be sure to find the fault. So this is the definition of the probability. It's basically the number of test runs where a fault is found over the number of test runs in total. We had this on, on 30 test runs per strategy, so this is always for one strategy. Um, when comparing the behavior of this uh, of this probability over the two uh, the two strategies, we get this graph, and the, the upper one is the OR strategy, the lower one is the PS strategy, and what we say right away is that both of them are very very similar. I mean they look the same. Do exactly the same. But what this graph does not show is that each fault is actually equally probable across both strategies. So you might have a fault which is very, very probable to be found by OR, which is on the far right in the OR, OR graph, but which is on the far left in the PS graph. We want all the faults to be near, near one. So when comparing these two strategies on the, on the detection probability in more detail, we get this graph, uh, where we have the, uh, the faults on the, on the x-axis. So in, in total, we found over 2,000 faults, around 2,000 faults. And on the y-axis, we have the difference in probability between PS and OR. Again, uh, it looks like an area, but it's made of a individual bars. What we're targeting for is the ones in the positive side and the ones in the, on the upper side. These are all the faults which are more probable to be found by PS. It means PS needs, uh, needs less runs to find them. In the middle are all the faults which are equally probable to be found by PS and OR. For these faults, it doesn't really make a difference if we use OR or PS. We're going to need, on average, the same number of runs to detect the fault. And this one is the not so nice part, uh, is when uh, the OR strategy is more probable to detect the fault. Uh, about the coloring, the yellow bars are faults found in both strategies. The green ones are only found by PS, and the red ones are found only by OR. Um, there's 37% of the faults which are more probable to be found by PS. Uh, 30, 39 percent are equally probable between PS and OR, so for them it does make a difference. But there's 24 percent when OR is more probable to find the fault. This again is not so um, In general, we can say that the PS strategy, the new strategy, is much more probable. Uh, it's, it, it does a much better job to find the fault systematically. On the left, we see the faults, they nearly go up to one. So each single test run will, will it's very probable to find this fault. So it's, whereas on the OR strategy, it goes down to around 30%. So the PS strategy really, for the faults it finds, it finds them much more systematically. Um, as I said, the, 
the third and more, most important point is the speed. Out of these uh, four important points, this is the last one. Uh, because even though we get nice results, we don't want it to be a lot slower than the original strategy. Uh, so this is the graph. Each, uh, well, on the x-axis is, uh, is the time. So we test it for one hour. And on the y-axis is the relative overhead. So everything close to zero is equally fast between OR and PS. What's positive means it's fast in PS. What's negative is fast in OR. Each of these lines here near, near the center represents one class group. The thick one in the middle is the median of all class groups. Uh, the blue one is the fastest one. The red is the slowest one. So on average, we have only a 0.03% overhead, which is uh, yeah, legible. It's, it's, it's nothing. Um, the fastest run might be surprising why the fastest run is so much faster. It's because the PS strategy managed, well, it was, the PS strategy was used very often, and every time it was used, it managed to generate a valid test case. So in the end, there were a lot more valid test cases. Whereas the slowest one was also very, used very often, the PS strategy, precondition satisfaction. But then the suggested solution actually did not work. So a lot of time it was uh, wasted, wasted resources, wasted time. Yes. Um, there are still some routines untested by the PS strategy. As I showed you, there's more than half of the untested ones were then covered by PS, but it means the other half was not covered by the PS strategy. We identified two groups, basically, why this, uh, why this happened. One is not related to the strategy, so we really cannot do anything about this. The, it accounts for about half of the, of the routines. It's, for example, preconditions which are hard-coded as being unsatisfiable. It's an artifact of uh, class inheritance. It should actually not happen, but it happens in those libraries, so really we cannot do anything about this. Second one is that some routines need a different environment. For example, some can only be executed on .NET, whereas we test it on Linux. So these also we cannot we cannot test them. It's not that that the strategy could have. The second one is strategy related. It means this could really could potentially be improved by the strategy. It's also about half of the of the untested routines. Um, so out of bad luck, it might happen that we never create a uh, satisfying combination. If a routine needs a particular combination and the random algorithm just chooses one which does not satisfy this, then it's just out of bad luck. So this is part of random testing. It just happens. The second one is, uh, as Jason said before, it might happen that even though in the pool, the pool says this combination satisfies the precondition, it might happen that the objects in this combination get damaged before they're used. So yeah, there's different strategies we could, different different algorithms we could use for this. We tried some of them, but this one performed better. And the third one would be that the test runs are not long enough. So if we would have tested longer, maybe that routine would have been tested. Uh, there are a few limitations to generalization. You cannot assume that these results are representative for, for everything. So in particular, the classes we chose are mostly data structures. So of course, if we apply this to classes uh, which are not data structures, to more I don't know, calculation classes or something like this, we might get different results. So this is really based on data structures. And the other limitation is that we used one-hour test runs. So in many of the, of the test classes, we did not reach a plateau on the number of faults. Let me show you on, on, on just two graphs, just to see what I mean. Uh, on the left, we have one which keeps increasing over time. And even after the one hour test run, it's not, it's not done yet. It might still grow. Whereas the one on the right clearly reaches a plateau. It's not very probable that they will find more faults. So maybe if we would have run longer test runs, it would have delivered a slightly different result. Um, now to the conclusion about the comparing the PS strategy with the OR strategy. 
I'm going to come back to the four important questions I mentioned earlier. One is how many more routines can we test compared to the OR strategy? Well, as I said, we can, we can test 56% of those untested before. So half of the routines which really could not be tested can now be tested. Uh, how often are these routines tested? As I said, over three and a half times as often. So this is really means three and a half times as many valid test cases are generated in the same amount of time. Um, how many more faults are detected? As I said, this is uh, the ultimate criterion for the uh, for, for random testing. Well, it finds 10% more faults overall. And how fast is it? As I said, it's negligible overhead, 0.03%. But also, as I said a few times in the in the evaluation, it's not a total replacement, not yet. It might need some future work. Um, it does not find all the faults with the OR strategy found. It did not, it, it missed 1% of the routines tested before. So it's not yet a total replacement, but we hope to make it. We hope to really um, replace the way random testing was done in the, the naive way by this uh, PS strategy. Which Any questions? Does it work this? Okay, great. Uh, on one particular graph, I think it was the fault coverage based on strategy, um, where you had the different uh, class groups. I noticed the first two class groups seemed to have a distinct number of faults that were only found by each strategy. And are, are, were there any particular characteristics to those class groups? Let uh, me just uh, go back Probably to good to go back to it. Okay, okay one? that one. Uh -huh. Yeah. And those the first two, yeah. They had quite a few that were found by PS and that were found by OR. Were there particular characteristics to the class groups that you think led that to happen, or has that been analyzed? Was one of those the lecture, for example? <laughs> For these two classes, actually, the, the PS strategy can test more because it's succeeding in testing more routines. And those routines, in turn, to, um, in turn, leads to some fault revealing um, states, object states. And on the green part, we also see that there are a long green part, which is not nice. This is because some of the faults here are class invariant faults. Class invariant faults, the same class invariant faults can be de detected um, within different calling situations. And they are marked as different faults because they are called from different contexts. Mm -hmm. And depend, depending on the randomness, it can be it, different um, faults revealing the same class invariant can be detected. That's why we see this. Um, difference in a long land. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you're trying to replace the OR strategy by the PS1. Um, why not trying to mix both strategies to take? <laughs> I see that somebody else also has to take the best of both of them, as uh, it, looks, it looks like another illustration, as there is no silver bullet. There won't be one that will beat anyone, anyone else, so why not try to mix them? Actually, um, in this graph that Jason showed, it shows that they are actually mixed. We have this heuristic, the PR uh, decision function, which uses some heuristics, to decide if we're going to stay on the OR strategy to what's shown in the green box, or if we're going to move on the PS strategy. So basically, we do mix both of them. It would be too expensive to only use the PS strategy, especially for routines which um, do not have strong preconditions or don't have preconditions at all. For these, we don't want to, to call the PS strategy and incur a very big overhead by doing so. So this, we leave it to the OR strategy. 
So really, we want, we want the PS strategy to replace the OR strategy, the, the naive one. But actually, the PS strategy is kind of a hybrid approach. Well, it is designed to be mixed at first, but we don't know um, the optimal mixing criteria. For example, if in the first five minutes we use only OR and later we use um, PS, and to turn it on and off frequently, we don't know which is the optimal configuration, but we are trying to do that. It is a good question, and it's a frequently asked one. To Thank you. Oh, I see. Yes, Hi. Uh, I have a short question regarding the uh, wave pool. As I can see that uh, the wave pool is highly, you know, correlated to the result what you have shown. And I can imagine you have a cold start phase for the wave pool. And how do you initialize this wave pool? And uh, have you tried to test it from a different, uh, say, strategy to initializing the wave pool? Actually, I'm going to start and maybe you can also. Um, actually, we don't set it up. It's set up as testing proceeds because it's closely linked to the test cases. So actually, it's, uh, it's populated after each test case. So as testing goes on, the wave pool just grows. So there's no real setting up and there's no real overtime in there. So we start from emptying. Uh, yes, so, okay. I see. That's a thing that works. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for me, it's uh, quite surprising uh, that uh, sometimes the OR strategy is better than the PS strategy. I think it's also surprising for you, too. Did you try to understand why this, this happens? Yes. Um, we don't. We don't get a full picture, so it's just some um, guesses from the data that we analyzed so far. Mm. On one hand, the PS strategy succeeded in testing, in generating more test cases for the hot routine in the same period of time, which means it spends less time in testing the easy routine. Mm -hmm. yes. Which um, so. Well, in another words, less test cases for easy one. Mm -hmm. So it may be possible that fewer, testic, fewer test cases covers or miss some part of the object state space that can be explored by the OR if there, if there are more test cases. It's, it's maybe also not possible because the PS strategy is some kind of recursive tree. Eh? Is going is starting with one precondition, then if, if it's okay, it goes farther and farther and farther and builds a kind of of precondition tree. In, in general, we found out that uh, to find one, if there is one in the pool, a combination, satisfying combination in the pool, it's yeah. very fast. So yeah. there's not there are huge amounts of possible combinations, mm -hmm. but satisfying combinations are quite few. Yeah. So once we focus in the vpool, there's only the satisfying ones. So once we focus on finding one, even though there's this tree and, and we go back and if it doesn't if it doesn't match, we yeah we backtrack. Even with all this, it's very very fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But can it can it not be possible that uh, by by building this uh, this tree of satisfying combination, there is some 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 kind of of dark uh, pattern which the OR strategy finds because it has no no intelligent logic and the PS strategy fails because it has some intelligent logic. It might, but since the OR is purely random based, yeah. if it's really just one particular case which PS would miss and that OR finds, for OR to find this one case is very, very improbable. So actually it could not be systematic. We're still trying to figure out exactly <laughs> what is the reason. But this, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's because I think it's just well, too improbable. There may be dark corners, but we don't know. But um, one thing is that the PS and the OR are intertwined together. Yeah. So there, there, in the experiment of the to evaluate the PS strategy, part of the OR is still running. It's not yeah, yeah, it's clear. PS. You you mix them and then you get the best of so both. So theoretically. Yeah. 
if a fault can be found by OR, it should be found by PS also. Mm -hmm. Although it is not observed. Yeah, yeah, that's the point, theoretical, but you see the graph and yeah, it sure. say something else. So that's why <laughs> I was asking. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the type of faults it's finding. Uh, yes. I'm quite surprised. <clears throat> you said this is a production library you're testing, yet it seems there must have been five, six hundred faults at least. Uh, what sort of faults are these? Because it seems that's not a... All um, kinds of different faults. So really, as I said, this is production mm -hmm. software. Uh, some faults were already discovered before in these libraries, but they were not yet fixed. I mean, the library we used is in the state as it's now in the subversion tree. It's these are open source libraries. So yeah, all kinds of different different parts. But it is it is surprising that there's so many faults in production libraries. It's considering it's there's simple <laughs> data structures. No, but that it's surprising that there's so many which are quite easy to find. 